why have I selected uh, why did I I could have talked any any subject of the railway that I chose the Marcos for a simple reason that um, of my in my entire working life I've spent ten years at Jamalpur. First for four years as an apprentice, and then later six years posted in the workshop as well as as a professor at the institute. Of course, Jamalpur is important in its own way. As Mr. Vinamathu mentioned, it is perhaps the oldest township railway township in the country. It is also one of the largest workshops in the country. In fact, till Chitranjan Locomotive Works was built, Jamalpur perhaps was the largest workshop in the country. Oldest, it was set up in 1862, and it literally pioneered mechanical engineering in the country. See, there, must, there were a lot of skills available. There was a lot of mechanical engineering available, but nothing on a formalized scale which came only after the setting up of the Jamalpur workshop. Also, since there was no other industry in the country, Jamalpur did almost everything by itself. As uh, I will mention later, they had their own power house. They had their own rolling mill. They had four foundries. I mean, two cast iron foundries, one steel foundry, and one white metal foundry. Uh, when there were I mean, all kinds of uh, uh, things available, uh, the Cast iron foundry even cast things like the cylinder of the steam locomotives, which is a very complicated casting. I mean, few foundries in the country will probably manage it even today. So it was a totally self-reliant workshop. It repaired and built steam locomotives for as long as 130 years. And of course, as Mr. Marshall mentioned, it has got a large training institute. There are equally large or no, more larger training institutes in the country, uh, but this was the only one that not just trained, but educated uh, mechanical engineers who were called special class railway apprentices. If you enter Jamalpur uh, railway colony, somewhere in the middle, you've got a large golf course. And looking at the golf, golf course, you'll see a, a big, huge tree in the middle of the golf course. And under the tree, you will see what looks like a grave. If you go have a closer look, you will find it is a grave. Now, what makes the grave interesting is the epitaph that is on the grave. Of course, now it is very difficult to read, but this is what it says. Sacred to the memory of Thomas Pelham Roberts, formerly of the Vulcan Foundry, Warrington, and afterwards foreman of the locomotive erecting shop of Jamalpur, who lost his life from the effects of an encounter with a tiger near this place. Died 13th day of June, 1864. His age was 27 years. Now, this epitaph tells you a lot of things. One, it tells you that the foreman of the erecting shop, when the workshop was set up, was only 27 years old. Today, the foreman of the erecting shop is probably in his 50s. Second, the tigers roamed in what is today the Jamalpur East Colony, where all the officers and senior supervisors came. So, I mean, in such a place where tigers were roaming, and which was so far from Calcutta, why was Jamalpur chosen to set up the, the large locomotive workshop of the railways? There are many reasons. One of them was that this area around Jamalpur and Mumbai district of Bihar today has always been known for the iron working skills of the local workmen. Of course, most of these skills were used to, to produce spears and guns and swords and items like that. But all the same, the skills were there. So you were pretty certain that if you set up a mechanical workshop here, you will have the necessary mechanics and fitters with the necessary skills. The first line that was being built from Howrah towards Delhi followed the river. In fact, it is what we today call the Saibgan Loop. It followed the river and uh, when the decision was taken to shift the workshop, the line went up to roughly where Jamalpur is today. So the workshop was shifted to Jamalpur. The water supply at Jamalpur is very good because you're only eight kilometers from the Ganges River. So with water available and uh, good industrial skills available, it was a good decision to shift the workshop to Jamalpur. On the, at the same time, Howrah was getting very congested. 
you already had a carriage and wagon works, you already had a local works, you were having the headquarters of the uh, East Indian Railway there. It became very congested and there was no scope for expansion. So it was decided to shift. Of course, there is a very apocryphal story about the carriage and wagon superintendent once going to a place called the Wilson Coffee House. When he went there, he found that three of the senior foremen and two drivers were there during working hours, working hours, not only in having coffee, but even gambling and so on. So he decided that he must shift the workshop as far from Howrah as possible. And therefore, he decided to shift it to Jamalpur. Apart from all this, the surroundings of Jamalpur are very congenial. As you will see on, with the picture on the right, uh, there's a finger of hills on the eastern edge of Jamalpur, which gives a very picturesque look to the whole town. In the middle of these hills, you'll also see a tunnel. Now, this is a very short tunnel, about 200 meters only, but very interesting. It is the oldest tunnel on the Indian railways. The tunnels of the Bhor Ghat and the Thul Ghat on, from Mumbai towards Pune and Nasik came up only in about 1864 or 65. So this tunnel was the, is the oldest rail tunnel in the country. And it was the opening of this tunnel in 1861. Huh? They led to the opening of the workshop in 1862. In fact, the workshop could have been opened even in 1860. But since the tunnel was not there, there was no link between Howrah and Jamalpur. So the opening of this tunnel led to the opening of the workshop. At that time, and even now, on that particular route, it is the only tunnel between Delhi and so, although it's a small tunnel, it's a very significant and important tunnel. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, sorry, Apurva. Uh, PowerPoint is not We are seeing only your face. Uh, so, you will have Do to show pardon? us. Uh, we, I can't see the PowerPoint. Nobody can see the PowerPoint. So, just uh, share that screen. Let me share it again. Yes, sir. And please uh, show the tunnels and all those things. Yeah. Wait a minute. Yes, sir. Sorry. I'll have to get a put on this. Oh, my. What is happening with this? My Vinny, can you let me in? I seem to have got cut off from my laptop. Yeah. I don't know why it got cut off. In recording in progress. Yeah. Is it being shared now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perfect. I think it is. Ah, uh, full screen. Kar dije. That's it. We are done. Uh, kar diya, kar diya. Done, sir. Excellent. In fact, this is the earlier screen where I was showing the hills and the tunnel through it. Uh, this is the screen prior to that. I don't know if you saw this screen or not. No, sir, we didn't see any of the presentation. So if you want oh, to start, you should have told me much before. <laughs> Chat will be written. Anyway, sir, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, if it goes off again, let me know. I don't know why that got cut off. See, this is the tree with the um, you know, with the grave under it in the middle of the golf course in Jamalpur. This screen, did you see? I didn't see any. So this is good. Okay, and this one? Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah, okay. yes, sir. And I think the first screen you have seen. Yes, sir. In fact, I must tell you about this uh, uh, this figure that you can see. This is actually a casting, one meter by one meter, and weighing almost half a ton. It was cast in Jamalpur workshops in 1870, and it was placed in front of the locomotive that pulled the train of the Viceroy Lord Mayo. Now, the very fact that such a casting could be cast in Jamalpur is proof, if any is needed, of the skills that the workmen have. 
this casting is still available and it is hanging on a wall outside the chamber of the director at the training institute at Jamalpur. It is there even today and it can be seen. In fact, I took this photograph only about three or four years back. Okay, now this screen is okay? Yes. Yes, sir. Now everything is okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. And this is the epitaph. Okay, I was I was talking to you about this tunnel. It is the only tunnel between Howrah and Delhi on this line. Now, of course, the center piece of the town, Jamalpur, is the railway workshop. If you remove the railway workshop from Jamalpur, then Jamalpur becomes a village. There's nothing else in Jamalpur except the workshop. And everything is around it, whether it's the railway colony, whether it's the town, is catering to this workshop itself. It covers 5.7 lakhs square kilometers. Uh, I remember the first time when we had I joined Jamalpur as an apprentice. At that time, the only train between Delhi and Jamalpur was the Upper India Express, 14 down. It used to start from Old Delhi Station and go to Sialda. It left Old Delhi at about 8 o'clock in the evening and reached Jamalpur at about 11 at the, the next night. Of course, the day we went, we were five of us new apprentices together on the train and we were approaching Jamalpur. Suddenly, we saw a wall on our right and the wall continued and continued and continued. Later on, of course, I found that the wall is almost two kilometers long. That is the length of the workshop. It's a massive workshop uh, covering a huge area. And uh, as I said, it was the largest workshop on the Indian railways till Chitranjan Locomotive Works was set up. That was larger. When we were apprentices, it had a staff strength of 14,000. Uh, I believe in the Second World War time, it had a staff strength of 22,000. But even today, I'm not sure of the staff strength today, but I think it's of the order of 10,000, making it a fairly large workshop. As mentioned earlier, it is a totally self-sufficient workshop. Apart from Ford Foundries and its own power house and smithy and fourth shop and things like that, it even have a, had things like a rolling mill. The picture on the right is of the rolling mill taken uh, about, uh, I would say, about roughly 100 years back. Among the activities that Jamalpur Workshop is doing today is repair and overhaul of diesel locomotives, manufacture and repair of 140-ton cranes, manufacture and repair of tower cars. Tower cars are used for uh, maintaining the overhead electrification on, le on uh, electrified areas, now very much required. It manufactures overalls and repairs various types of wagons. It repairs and manufactures Jamalpur jacks. Jamalpur, the, the Jamalpur jacks are heavy duty jacks. Uh, you can have four jacks together working simultaneously so that they can lift up a locomotive or lift up a coach and you can attend to the item concerned. This is a view of the machine shop at Jamalpur picture taken around 1900. It's a massive shop. You can see how big it is. I remember the first time that I entered the shop, I even thought I could see the curvature of the earth that, that big. The same applies to almost all the shops in Jamalpur. I'm not talking about the locomotive shop, those of course are massive, but the machine shop, the wheel shop, the uh, forge shop, the smithy shop. The forge shop used to forge the connecting rods and the coupling rods of the steam locomotives. Not easy forgings. In other words, uh, this workshop was entirely self-sufficient and managed to do everything on its own. It did not rely on industry at all. It even had its own bolt and nut shop, something you won't think of doing today because bolts and nuts can be easily bought in the market. But this shop made its own bolts, made its own nuts, made its own rivets. So all these items were made, made in this shop. I'll give you an idea of some of the years that the, the significant, significant events of the workshop, which will also tell you the kind of diversity it has. As already mentioned, it was established in 1862. By 1872, it had already assembled and commissioned 452 locomotives, mostly for the East Indian Railway. See, in those days, the, the locomotives were all manufactured in Great Britain, uh, but it was difficult to ship them as full locomotives. So a lot of the parts were dismantled and the parts were sent to India. And then 
workshops in India assembled those locomotives. One of the main assembly points for this assembly was Jamalpur workshop. And as I said, in the first 10 years of its existence, it did something like 50 locomotives a year. In 1879, it added a rolling mill. By 1885, it had manufactured a tender. Not only locomotive items, it also manufactured a lot of other items. Like in 1894, it started the manufacture of crossings and signals. I remember when we were in Jamalpur, it was manufacturing brick blocks. We were also manufacturing um, these cast iron uh, sleepers that, that were used as sleepers. Of course, now we don't use them anymore, but they were being manufactured then. In 1898, a steel foundry was added. As mentioned earlier, today Jamalpur has four foundries. Two for cast iron, one for white metal, and one steel foundry. In 1899, steam loco manufacture started, and the first loco was turned out. The picture on right, I think, is of the first locomotive, but I'm not sure. The first locomotive was a CA class 060 locomotive. This locomotive is 060, so I think it is the first loco one of the first locomotives that was built. But don't, uh, I mean, I can't vouch for it. I'm not very sure if it was, the, if this picture is actually of the first locomotive. I got this from the book that the Marple produced when they completed 150 years. Uh, Jamalpur started manufacture of locomotives in 1899 and continued till 1923. Uh, they manufactured roughly 250 locomotives. In fact, they started manufacture of locos in the 1880s, but it became 1899 before they were actually able to turn out their first locomotive. In 1901, Jamalpur added a uh, I think this uh, statement is wrong, but the statement in, the, in 1901 was not an electric powerhouse, it was a steam coal based powerhouse. It was only in the 1860s that it was, con 1960s that it was converted to electric diesel. In 1913, it added a water filtering work on top of a hill. As I mentioned to you earlier, the water from, for Jamalpur comes from the river Ganges. Now that is about uh, so 9 to 10 kilometers away. The water comes from the Ganges to the top of the hill where you have a water filtration plant. And then from the top of the hill, by gravity, it is sent to the workshop and to the colony below. It is a very interesting system, a very good system, and it has been working for more than 100 years. Thank you. Who, when, who, who was the thank you? Carry on. Okay, anyway. In 1950, after independence, Jamalpur cast a 50 ton annual for Chitranjan locomotive works. I understand they had made even heavier castings later, uh, which were the slowest gates of the DVC project. So the Jamalpur foundry had the capacity to make such large castings. <clears throat> One of the very intricate castings I had shown to you right in the beginning. So they could make intricate castings and they could make large castings. In 1961, Jamalpur actually manufactured a 500 kg electric arc, arc furnace of its own. In 1961, it built its first steam crane. These were 10 ton cranes. Later on, they built 20 ton cranes, and even later, they built diesel cranes of 20 ton, ca ton capacity. The picture on the right is of the offices of the workshop as they are today. See, by 1862, Jamalpur had manufactured its first brake van. In 1864, they started manufacture of Jamalpur jacks. In 18, 1978, we started overall of diesel hydraulic locomotives. These were WDS Ford locomotives. A lot of them did not belong to the Indian Railways, but were uh, belonged to Port Trust and belonged to PSUs, who sent them to Jamalpur for overhaul. By 1982, when steam locos were reducing, we started the overhaul of diesel electrics, mostly alcohol locomotives. Again, because of requirements of electrification, we needed tower cars. 
So by 1983, you started building tower towers. 1986, you assembled the first 140 ton crane. If you go around the railways today, you will find almost all the breakdown cranes you have on broad gauge are these 140 ton cranes. These were originally built and designed by Gottwald, who did a transfer of technology to India. And Jamalpur began manufacturing these 140 ton cranes. When you said in 1996, they assembled the crane, right? this is because all the parts came from Germany and only assembly was done in India. Later on, of course, Jamalpur began manufacturing these cranes completely by itself. The picture on the left is that of a 140 ton Cotwall design uh, breakdown crane. In 1989, a diesel shed was opened in Jamalpur. Three years back, it was still there. I'm not sure if it's still there now. With so much electrification, the chances are that the shed won't last very long. But definitely, 2018, it was there. Apart from homing locomotives and maintaining locomotives, it also maintained a number of uh, diesel rail cars. All good things come to an end. So in 1992, the last steam locomotive was overhauled at Jamalpur workshop. And since then, there has been no more steam loco POH. Now, since steam loco work stopped, you had to fill up the workshop with something else, or the workshop itself may have closed down. So you began overhauling wagons. This was in the same year that steam locomotive overall stopped. In 1994, the first 140 ton breakdown crane was fully manufactured at Jamalpur and turned out. The overhauling of wagons had already been taken up. You soon took up the uh, manufacture of wagons too. And the first wagons that were manufactured were these low body container wagons, uh, the A and B cars. This I'm not too sure about, but I understand that by 2012, uh, two WDS six class locomotives were manufactured uh, for rights. This I'm not too sure about, so don't quote me on this. Now, that was all about the workshop. But as uh, Mr. Mathur mentioned, one of the things that makes Jamalpur special when compared to other workshops is the large training facilities that were attached to it. Well, let's give you an idea of some of these training facilities and when they started. The workshop was set up in 1862, and in 1888, uh, the training of trade apprentices was started. Now, trade apprentices were apprentices whom you trained for three years in artisan trades, that is, as mechanics, uh, fitters, or painters, or carpenters, and jobs like that. So, this school was set up. It was called the technical school then. And later on, as the school developed, it became the Indian Railway School of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. And it's today called the Indian Railways Institute of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. You may be intrigued by the word electrical in the name. That is because till about 1940, the training of all electrical engineers also was being done at Jamalpur. In fact, some of the earliest electrical engineers on the Indian Railways who were trained and educated in India were from Jamalpur. Uh, if I recall right, the chief electrical engineer in Calcutta uh, when the first electric train ran in Calcutta, was Mr. R. S. Potter, who is from the 1936 batch of special class railway apprentices. Of course, uh, around 1940 or so, the training of electrical engineers was stopped at Jamalpur. And after that, Jamalpur only produced mechanical engineers. In 1905, you started the apprentice mechanic scheme for Anglo Indians. Of course, for obvious reasons, you first started it for Anglo Indians only. Apprentice mechanics were taken after high school, had an apprenticeship for five years, and at the end of five years were absorbed as supervisors in the workshop. Uh, this apprentice mechanic scheme was abolished sometime around 1970 or so. I don't remember the exact year. In 1911, you started app apprentice mechanics from non Anglo Indians also. And of course, in 1927, the special class revenue apprentice scheme was launched. 
See, apart from special class railway apprentices who became mechanical engineers in the railways, uh, after independence, you began recruiting uh, mechanical engineers from the market also. And all of them, that is the apprentices from Jamalpur and the direct recruits, uh, became officers in the Indian Railway Service of Mechanical Engineers. The, from 1970 onwards, the direct recruits did not come to Jamalpur, but they went to Khadakpur, where you had an officer on special duty who looked after their training interests. But after they were absorbed in the railways, all further training, like refresher courses and training in diesels and things like that, that was run in Jamalpur. So training of all IRSM officers was centralized at Jamalpur, but probationary officers kept going to Kharagpur. It was only in 1988 that even probationary officers came for their probationary training to Jamalpur, but the Kharagpur establishment remained. And 1997, the Kharagpur establishment was abolished and all mechanical officers, whether direct recruits or special class railway apprentices, uh, for their professional training, reported to Jamalpur, and their training was controlled by the director at Jamalpur. In fact, this is nothing special about uh, uh, mechanical officers. For all officers do their professional training in centralized training institutes all over the country. For example, civil engineers do their training at the institute in Pune. Uh, electrical engineers do their training at the institute in Nasik. The signal and telecom engineers do their training at the institute at Sikandrabad. And uh, the non-technical services go for the training to the National Academy of Indian Railways at Barodhra. Uh, a training institute has also been opened at Lucknow for traffic officers. So while all professional officers go to their respective training uh, for training, the training of special class apprentices is what made Jamalpur special. Now, what was the special class apprentices training? See, what happened was that in the beginning when the British started the railways, all the higher posts were held by Britishers only. The few Indians who made it to the top were also those who had been educated and did their engineering in Great Britain or some foreign country. There were almost no Indian engineers educated in India who made it to the higher levels of the Indian railways. Why Indian railways? It probably applied to all departments of the government. Now when the National Congress Party took up uh, agitation for independence. They also began making a lot of noise that we should have Indians at the higher echelons of the railways and other services. Now, the British found that there were good civil engineering colleges in the country. There was one at Lahore, there was one at Turkey. They were good. So they began inducting civil engineers from these colleges. But they found that in the 1920s, they did not find any mechanical engineering college worthwhile. So they decided that they will educate their mechanical engineers in-house. That is why they decided to set up the special class railway apprentice scheme. And at that time, the best training facilities and the largest workshop was at Jamalpur. So the special class railway apprentice scheme was launched at Jamalpur in 1927. The first batch of six people joined at Jamalpur in 1927 on the 14th of February. It is very interesting that it was Valentine's Day. I don't know whether Valentine's Day was celebrated then or not. The scheme lasted 90 years. It finally closed down in 2019 and the last batch was recruited in 2015. So the passing out of that batch, uh, there are no more special class uh, apprentices in Jamalpur anymore. Uh, the building you see on the right is of the, of the Institute of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering at Jamalpur. Uh, the building still exists. Of course, it is, not, it is not training apprentices anymore, but it is doing for uh, railway officers, for railway supervisors, all levels of courses. I mean, it has a full-time job even now. I would also like to mention that while the training of uh, uh, all in-house officers and supervisors is done by officers posted on the Indian Railways. For the education of special class apprentices, there were five professors who had been recruited directly from the market. And their job was not to do anything with the railways, but they taught mechanical engineering.
See, earlier when uh, we had joined as apprentices, the minimum qualification for joining Jamalpur was intermediate. Later on, when class 2 was introduced, the minimum qualification became class 12. Post-independence, the entrance exam has been is conducted by the UPSC. As Mr. Matsu mentioned, it was, a, it was a very tough exam and very difficult to make it. Uh, the average number of people who joined Jamalpur each year over the, over the 90 years that it existed is less than 15. The total number of apprentices who passed out of Jamalpur is about 1,400, which is an extremely small number. After you got recruited, you spent four years in Jamalpur. It was like four years in an engineering college with the difference that there were no summer holidays, there were no winter holidays, and the practical training that you normally do in a college, that was done in the Jamalpur workshop. Since Jamalpur workshop encompassed almost all aspects of mechanical engineering, you got exposed to these aspects while you were a student. Uh, I've always felt that you may go to the best engineering college in the world, but that feel of what it is like walking in a workshop with a 100-ton locomotive going over your head, that feel you will never get, which as apprentices you got in the Jamalpur workshop. When the scheme was initially introduced, you did four years in Jamalpur, and that was followed by two years in Great Britain. This was stopped during the Second World War. And of course, soon after that, we got independence and nobody went to UK after that. So those two years you spent as probationers on the Indian railways. These two years have now been reduced to 18 months. Today, it is till the, as long as the scheme was there, it was four years as an apprentice in Jamalpur and one and a half years as a probationer on the railways. The training in Jamalpur was what you would call sandwich training. You spent some time in the training institute on theoretical training and some time in the workshop on practical training. You had internal exams both in theory and in practicals. And to make sure that you did not lag behind, you also did external examinations. In our time, it used to be the examination of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers London, part A, B, and C. Later on, it became the Engineering Council London. And, late, and uh, even later, you could even do the exam of the of AMI in India itself. In the 90s, Jamalpur attached itself to Pitt Ranchi and Pitt gave them a formal degree in mechanical engineering. So it is not that you only did internal examinations, but you also did external examinations so that uh, you made sure that your qualifications matched uh, normal engineering. The building you see back is the hostel of the special class railway apprentices. It is certainly the most impressive building in Jamalpur. And I hope the railway authorities are able to get formal heritage status for it. Because it would be a very sad day if this building is destroyed or disfigured in any way. It's a beautiful building. I mean, generations of apprentices have lived in it and will vote for the fact that this is one of the most, uh, let's say, architecturally balanced buildings you can think of. It is certainly the most impressive building that you get in Jamalpur town. Now, you, you may well feel that if you join as an apprentice at Jamalpur, you will be very well suited for a railway job. Of course, you are. But the interesting thing is that perhaps the maximum dropouts from the railways at the officer level have been from people who are from Jamalpur. I have done an actual count between 1950 four batch and the 1970 batch. A total of 250 people had passed out of Jamalpur. And at the time when I did my counting in about 1992, only 150 were still on the railways. 100 had left the railways. So the number of people who left the railways and done well outside is very large. I can't give you the full list right now, but I would certainly like to mention a few names which are easily recognizable. Mr. P.C. Luther, who was from 1944 batch, uh, he became chairman of STC and also became the CEO of DVC, the Damodar Valley Corporation. At that time, electricity in Calcutta and West Bengal was in shambles. But Mr. P.C. Luther, in spite of all the problems that Bengal had in those days, was able to turn DVC around and produce electricity, so much so that Calcutta did not have electricity problems 
after that. Mr. M. M. Suri, his name is well known. He is the guy who designed and patented the Suri transmission, which we used on a WDS4 locomotives. He also, uh, he's, uh, the Suri, the S in SAN engineering, SAN, the S stands for Suri. It was set up by Suri and Nair. Uh, Suri provided the technical expertise, whereas Nair did the financial part. Mr. R.K. Pachodi, Dr. R.K. Pachodi, also well known. He was director of Terry for a very, very long time. And he was a recipient jointly of a Nobel Prize for his organization. Mr. J.S. Choker, another uh, person whose name is well known. He was dean of faculty at IIM Ahmedabad for quite a long time. And after retirement, has set up the De Association for Democratic Reform. You'll see him on TV and his articles in newspapers very often. Another well-known name is Ashni Lohani. Although he continued in the railways, he did an excellent job for heritage revival, did a very good job for tourism, and he was the CEO of Air India for quite some time. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, the number of special class apprentices who done very well outside the railways is very large. So obviously, I won't go through those names. And many of them have done well in fields, which had nothing to do with the railways or mechanical engineering. Now, let us come to the colony itself. As Mr. Mathur mentioned, this is perhaps the first railway township in the country. And its design was followed by many other townships that were set up later. As I also mentioned, if you take away the railways from Jamalpur, Jamalpur may not even be a village. Perhaps the first railway town. Uh, the main colony was on the eastern side of the town, and it was called the European colony. At that time, you only had European and perhaps a few Anglo Indian in it. Today, it is egalitarian and it's called the Jamalpur East Colony. Hello. Like all railway colonies, most of the buildings are brick red. And like all railway colonies, it has a large number of churches. Most of the denominations of churches that you had in Christianity, you would, you would find in Jamalpur. This one, I think, is the Anglican, Anglican church. You will, you will find that, this, I took this photograph about um, five years back. You will find that the church is well maintained even now. Although the number of Anglo Indians in, uh, or Christians in Jamalpur is very small now. All railway colonies today have got an institute. It is often called the Central Institute. And it is uh, very well uh, organized. It will have wooden dance floors. It will have billiards tables. It will have a swimming pool. It will have tennis courts. And the kind of functions and parties you have in it are, I mean, worth going to. The Jamalpur Jamkhana, which is the hospital of the special class apprentices, I already mentioned. From 1988, when the training of probationary officers started in Jamalpur, they have to be housed somewhere. A new hostel called Jantrik Nivas was built for them. Of course, it is nowhere near as impressive as Jamalpur Jamkhana, but a fairly good building on its own. Rudyard Kipling, the great writer, had visited Jamalpur in 1880. It would be worth reading what he had to say about the colony. Of course, it's a long article. I've only taken out one small extract from it. It says, Crotons, palms, mangoes, wellingtonias, teak and bamboos adorn it, and the poncetias, bougainville, the railway creepers, bionia, then stuff, make it gay with colors. It is laid out with military position, precision. To each house, it's just share of gardens, its brick red path, its growth of trees, and his neat little wicket gate. The designers made houses of one gender design, some of brick, in fact, I would say mostly of brick, some of stone, some three, four, six rooms, some single men's barracks, and some two story, all for the use of the employees. King's Road, Princess Road, Queen's Road, Victoria Road, cut the breadth of the station, and Albert Road, Church Road, and Steam Road, the length of it. This is what Rudyard Kipling had to say more than 100 years back. In fact, the Jamalpur workshop is also mentioned in Jules Verne's book, Around the World in 80 Days, when the hero travels by train from Bombay to Calcutta and crosses Jamalpur, 
and he mentioned that early morning he saw the chimneys of the workshop at the market. Of course, the names of most of these roads have changed now. If you enter the railway colony from the station side, uh, the first and you go down the what you might call the main road of the market, the first road on the right goes to the workshop and it's called the workshop road. The next road goes past the officer's uh, club, so it's called the club road. The next road goes uh, past the railway stadium, so it's called the stadium road. The next road goes along the golf course and it's called the golf road. After that, there are no more roads to the right, but the first road to the left goes to Jimkhana, so it's called Jimkhana road. So, the, interestingly, Queen's Road is still there, and the hostel where the apprentice mechanic stayed is called Queen's Road Hostel. That's still, that is still there. It is now used by trainee uh, supervisors who come to Jamalpur for trainees. The apprentice mechanic scheme, of course, stopped long back. I will show you some of the buildings that you will see in Jamalpur. The building on the left is that of the Central Institute. You can find that it is built in uh, old style. I won't dare mention what style it was when Mr. Mathur is hearing, because he'll probably correct me immediately. On the left, on the right is another church that you will see in Jamalpur. Here, the left picture is another view of the Special Laws Railway Apprentice Hostel, the Jamalpur Jimkhana. As you can see, it's a very impressive and well balanced building. On the right, you will see one of the houses in which the senior officers of the workshop and of the training institute stayed. This is the house in which I stayed. So it's a you know, you can see the number of trees in it, the garden in it, the maintenance, it's all very well done. I only hope the Malpur remains that way. One item I must mention before I sign off, and that is this particular locomotive. This is the Express, the sister locomotive of the Ferry Queen. The Express stood in front of the main offices of Jamalpur between 1909 and about 1999. It stood there and it was, uh, it was as much part of the office as you could think of, or as much part of Jamalpur as you can imagine. Sometime in the 1990s, it was removed from here and taken to Howrah. Then later on in the 21st century, it was picked up by Southern Railway, who renovated the locomotive, put it in steam, and are today running it as a steam locomotive, as a working locomotive. Now its number is EIR 21, while the Fairy Queen, which is listed in the Guinness Book of Records as the oldest working steam locomotive, is EIR 22. So Southern Railway is now claiming that since the number is 21, it was obviously commissioned before EIR 22. So this should have the title of the oldest working locomotive in the world. Of course, I have always been suggesting that there's no point getting into a controversy. Both are part of the Indian Railways. So we should perhaps write to the Guinness Book of Records saying that the oldest pair of working locomotives in the world are EIR-21, the Express, and the ER-22, Ferry Queen. That is all I have to say. But of course, I'm open to anyone who would like to ask me anything. I would also like to mention the locomotive which is on the right. This is the ZDM2 locomotive, which now stands in front of the offices of the workshop, where the express used to stand in the old days. It is when I was putting this locomotive up that I thought that I must mention the express also. So thank you very much. I hope uh, you could gain something from it. If there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Hello. Hello. Yeah. So this is Sujit Gupta here. I had a question for you. Thanks for your lovely presentation. I knew that the oldest tunnel is near Jamalpur. My yeah. question is, uh, we all have seen this 1897 photographs taken during Lord Elgin's visit to Jamalpur. Uh, uh, you know, about 15, 16 photographs. Beautiful um, about the workshop and all. So uh, I want you, to know. You have photographs. Yeah, 1897 photographs taken during uh, Lord Elgin's visit to Jamalpur. Yeah, I think yeah. you have seen them. So I want to know: uh, uh, do, Does those uh, st structures still exist, like the foundry 
and the workshops and you know the, yeah, yeah. those things. Because, Marble workshop is still... because it can be a nice thing to do a uh, you know now and then kind of a presentation if somebody does it. Yes, I can work on that. And maybe yeah. sometime later we can have that presentation too. Yeah, yeah. But okay. basically the structure of Jamalpur workshop is yeah. by and large what it was about a uh, hundred years back. The only difference okay. being the kind of things they are manufacturing and the kind yeah. of thing they are doing is has changed. Okay. See, okay. Nothing can be as uh, labor intensive as a steam locomotive. So obviously yes, the yes, workshop yes. strength has gone down. In the same area, yes. they don't require so much staff. And of course, they yeah. don't require the kind of large forging and the large uh, casting that were required for a steam locomotive. So the yes. kind of work the shops are doing has changed. But the okay. workshop, the workshop different, different uh, individual shops are still there. But, okay, so you can make uh, out... But, uh, but may, out, may, uh, yeah. yes. may yes. I just add, Yes, in 1934, there was a famous Bihar earthquake. So during that earthquake, majority of the double-storied buildings were destroyed or damaged. Um, for example, the training institute uh, itself was a double-storied building. Now it is, you see it as a single-storied building. Okay. Many of the bungalows were double-storied and there were some very fine bungalows. Many of them yeah. were destroyed. Some of them Absolutely have been correct. Uh, perhaps not all. In fact, in fact, I will add a little to that. In the 1934 earthquake, most of the bungalows of the officers were destroyed. In fact, the bungalow that I was staying in, uh, I was very intrigued to find that the front garden was very small and the back garden was huge and massive. Then what I learned was that in, in the old days, the bungalow used to be in the middle of this uh, patch of land with an equal garden in front and at the back. Okay. Now, when the building got destroyed in the 1934 earthquake, um, they were in a hurry to build a new bungalow. So without removing the rubble of the old one, they built a new bungalow in front of it and then cleared the old bungalow. So the front garden became very small and the rear garden is massive. In fact, you can grow enough wheat to feed perhaps the whole town of Jamalpur in it. <laughs> very interesting, sir. Very interesting. <laughs> Okay. See, the only right. problem I find with Jamalpur was that while the workshop and the colony did very well and continued to do well, the town of Jamalpur did not develop at all. And in fact, I I think Mr. Bhiti is there on... Uh, are you there, Ranjit? Yes, sir, I'm here. I remember he had, uh, when I was a professor in Jamalpur, he had come for a training a refresher course through Jamalpur. And one day while chatting with all the officers who were there, I generally asked, what do you think is, how is the country doing? So Ranjit's answer, I still remember. He said, while I was on Western Railway, I thought the country was doing very well. But coming here, I'm not sure. <laughs> so that is Jamalpur's problem. Jamalpur town, see, I was there in the 60s and I was there in the 90s. It has yeah. not developed at all. It has only become more congested and worse. But I don't know what it is like today. But no. that is what... The problem with them. it was the town was not developing. So ultimately, when the town doesn't develop, even the workshop uh, certainly won't develop very well. Yeah. I'll give you I'll give a small I, incident. Yeah. Uh, carry on, carry on. Uh, sir, another slightly off topic, should I say, since I am also interested in birds. So what kind hmm. of birds do you see there? I mean, since it's near to the Ganga, I mean, maybe many water oh, birds. I started my bird watching in Jamalpur. My yes. guru was a gentleman called Devashish Ray. Okay. He started me on, on bird watching. In fact, I was I was not very interested in birds. I, I liked hiking and walking. And okay. I used to go hiking and walking in the hills, even on long yeah. walks. I mean, go off on Saturday afternoon and come back on Sunday evening. Oh and my take God. a small <laughs> tent with you and camp inside the hills. But okay. Devashish Ray was also fond and he used to come with me. He used to keep mentioning, yeah. see that bird, see that bird, see that bird. And after four or five high like this, I found I'd become quite good myself. Okay. And then that developed so much that uh, I have not been a serious bird watcher for the last 50 years. Oh, wow. You know, maybe 60 years now. Oh, great, sir. But I started in Jamalpur. Uh, okay. There's a small waterworks in Jamalpur. You see excellent yeah. birds there. Hmm. I have seen an osprey diving into that lake and catching a fish like maybe 20 feet from me. Wow. Oh. Yeah. The hills of Jamalpur also had excellent, uh, uh, not just bird life, but even wildlife. Yeah. One of one of our colleagues had even 
in the 60s shot a nil guy in the jamalpur hills very close to the town okay, okay. i don't i don't know if uh, anand you remember this yeah yeah that was that was mp roy mp roy had shot MP a nil guy and brought it back and uh, of course the all the cooks in the uh, in our hostel refused to cook the nil guy thinking it's a guy but it's not it's actually an antelope <laughs> yeah yeah finally we had one muslim cook called hanif outside the kitchen he cooked that <laughs> then you were able to have <laughs> rest for the next few days <laughs> very interesting very interesting <laughs> Jail sir, what about the brass parts? How did you cast the brass? Was it done in the white foundry? Yeah, in, in the white metal foundry. Okay. Oh, it was called the brass. It was called the brass and white metal foundry. Brass and white. Okay. Yes, it was a brass and white metal foundry. Right. In fact, that Good foundry was very interesting. When I joined Jamalpur in six, January '66, it was just after the after the war with Pakistan in '65. Those days, one part of the of the brass and white metal foundry had been closed to everybody. Because it was manufacturing grenade shells. Yeah, I wanted to mention that because mm. when we went to Jamalpur, one of the pride possessions was beautifully made hand grenade shells in the 1962 war. They were such fine no, castings, not, and not everyone used to use it as a pen stand. Mm. So, if I wish you could cover some of the items which were made for the war effort in 62 or war and as well as in 75 or 65 war. In 65 war, I think as far as I know, only grenade shells were made. And grenade shells, we used to see them distributed in the seniors' room because they were not being made when we were there. But they were beautifully cast, thin wall, beautifully made castings. I mean, precision castings, I should say. Of course, the the Ordnance part of the shells was done by the ordnance factories. The market only cast and made the shells. Yes, that's true. But the shell part was very well made. What I'm saying, it's a small, thin wall casting and doing it such proper finish uh, was a great job. And, uh, now, of course, all the foundries are, are closed. Those who want to know, all the foundries, steel foundry, cast iron foundry, metal foundry, all the foundries in Jamalpur are, are no longer when, functioning. When, 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 when were they closed? They were when closed in when steel foundry was closed when I was CME in 2006. 2005, okay. it was closed during Devashish Ray. And when I went in 2006, there was no foundry. I was only relocating the staff for converting, uh, making these gears, uh, these flat container wagons, converting those killing and, you know, reskilling them as welders and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, sir, if the, six, so sorry, 2004 if, 5 they must have been closed. So if, if the if the uh, if the foundries were working the X class which was made in uh, Golden Rock uh, last I mean few days back, that could have been made in Jamalpur completely. Because yeah, but huh? Jam Jamalpur foundries are no longer functioning. It is only must be in uh, they must have cast it in somewhere in southern region. Yes, yes, right, sir. Thank you. See, yeah, of course. Today, if you were to set up a workshop like Jamalpur, you will have none of these support shops because you can get you can get everything from the market. But when it was set up over 100 years back, there was no other thing, no other industry. So you had to do everything yourself. That bolts, you was talking about fasteners. Uh, yeah, we used we have seen those rolling mills making fasteners and every type of rivets and fasteners. And yeah, yeah. Like you, you, had, no said, you had a bolt and nut shop, you had a rolling yeah. mill. They were all functioning fully when we joined. Yeah, yeah, fully. fully the bolt at that shop, there's a big dispute with the excise, uh, excise. excise department. <laughs> I don't know whether Jamalpur had it, Matuga had it. They would every day come and say that they would put a demand notice <laughs> for it because they said you are manufacturing bolts and nuts which are commercially used. So. Uh, can I another sir, I have another problem with Jamalpur I will mention. Sir, I have a suggestion. I carry on. Uh, basically, the X-class locomotives that uh, uh, GOC is making, can somebody, maybe Mr. Uh, um, uh, Singh, uh, can sort of give an next presentation. That's a very interesting topic. Uh, I'm talking about Ajay Singh. Ajay, Ajay Singh. Maybe he was in GOC, so you may maybe somebody can cover it as a next topic. Uh, yeah, I think we have noted your query. I think Golden Rock workshop. Yeah, we'll do that. 
very important workshop. It it came up in the nineteen around nineteen thirty. Today, my friend, we could talk about uh, golden <laughs> So the X class they have manufactured about four or five. Jail, 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 sir. Fine. Jail, sir. I will tell you. I'll tell you a small incident which Hello? probably tells you why the Jamalpur area is not developing very well. See, while I was in the workshop uh, at Mungher, which is about eight nine kilometers away, there is one plant of the of ITC who manufactures their cigarettes there. the manager of the plant came and met us and said that uh, while all their cigarette manufacturing staff is recruited centrally by the organization uh, their ancillary staff they recruit from local people they go to the local employment exchange and pick up people from there normally all the people they get are rogues and thugs who know nothing about the work so they would like to recruit trade apprentices whom jamalpur workshop is training we said that is very good because earlier jamalpur used to absorb all the apprentices they trained but today because the workshop was reducing in strength they could not do so we said just fine please come and do it so they did it was a three year apprenticeship apprenticeship they came and uh, interviewed the final year guys and like a you know and they appointed three of them to the workshop on on successful completion of their apprenticeship Now, after the apprentices completed their apprenticeship, they didn't join. So, after a few months, I had called them over and I asked them, "Why aren't you joining at uh, ITC?" They said, "No, ITC joining is not enough. We have to join the Jamalpur Rail Carkhaning." So, I said, "Why? Why do you want to not go there? Is the salary less?" They said, "No, the salary, in fact, is more than the railways." And then, do you have a problem? Do you have to go to Mungher from Jamalpur? The guy said, "No, he lives in Mungher. He has to come to the Jamalpur workshop." I said, so, I mean, I knew the answer, but I kept. He never gave me the right answer, so I kept insisting. And finally, one guy said, "says Sir, वहाँ काम करना पड़ेगा." That is the problem. Now, because of that attitude, the area is not developing. Yes, sir. That is the only reason why Jamalpur is still there, and we are still trying to sell sourcing from Jamalpur SSC heritage. सर सर हेमंत कुमार हियर हाँ जी हाँ सर सम लिंकेज विद दी मुंगेर गन फैक्ट्री विद दी जमालपुर या इट इज इट इज स्टिल बट इन बट इन वेरी डीप वे वी कांट गो देयर एंड वी कांट डू एनीथिंग अबाउट इट बट द बट द थिंग आई वाज लिस्टिंग सर and he was hmm. saying about the culture and the society here why it is not developing the reason behind it is the mindset the mindset still here is the is the thing is that i'll get the i'll get the my salary and i don't have to do anything so i'll join the market so and and the same problem is occurring between uh, developing the heritage here now so we we want we want to save all the colonies here all the township which was built by uh, britisher and still their craftsmanship their their uh, mapping of all the colonies are beautiful if we can save those like, railway uh, railway is, uh, is spending money on manufacture on sorry on uh, repair and maintenance every year but if it is it is done within guidance of something you know like like you have you have nothing nothing um, like much you have to do for for maintaining those buildings and those beauty but you have to uh, you know like make a make a path to go on they are maintaining they are they are they are, they are demolishing everything you know like those buildings the shop that they are just building now new umbrella work is going on so all the sheds are being like tied up Uh, and you know like uh, all those things are getting apart so we we are just saving what we can do so so, so and and these these things take so much time so and we want to do like within the timeline within two or three years what we can save will be saved for like we have or we can save for heritage 
but all the things they are just like changing and like they keep changing and changing. they they they, they polish the old ones and they put like new ones right thanks yeah, any more yeah. any, any more questions please or comments uh anyone so this is uh, v anand here yeah go ahead mr yeah. anand uh, i I, I was in the 1962 examination of SCRS, and when we joined Jamalpur, it even had a permanent way school for training the permanent way staff. There was a small uh, section there for permanent way also. And uh, then the powerhouse had reciprocating three-stage uh, steam engine and two uh, turbines, steam turbines. And the workshop was laid out apart from AC uh, alternating current uh, thing. There was, there was a separate DC line which powered the cranes. And uh, these cranes had uh, electro, uh, what do you call it, dynamic brakes that uh, the DC motors would spin and generate power. Then there was a hydraulic pipeline all over the workshop. And uh, for the colony, some of the, for the DC, some of the um, AC output was fed to a, um, what they call a mercury arc rectifier bank. All this was there when we were references. Incidentally, it is we who found this uh, uh, crest it was lying in the uh, scrapyard, and we had a very loyal uh, uh, Anglo Indian called Taylor. He said we should. So the entire batch had to be called in. We dug it out of the mud, put it on a uh, on, on a sort of trolley, and brought it to the school. Then during the Second World War, a lot of uh, uh, Sites, I mean, items like bomb sites for the aircraft. And of course, uh, they made some armor plated uh, vehicles also. And when we joined, there was a lot of this armor plate steel lying around. So all the steel punches used to be made from this AP steel, it was called. And uh, one of the heritage items is the graveyard, but that I believe has been closed down. And there were a lot of poignant uh, memories there, you know, so and so passed away at the age of two, contracted cholera and stuff, stuff like that. Then the rolling mill, the original steam engine was imported and uh, it was copied uh, absolutely to the last detail and made in Jamalpur. So both the steam uh, rolling mills were working when we were apprentices. And uh, of course, the story about manufacture is that the locomotives came imported, I mean, in uh, what we call completely knocked down condition. And they had sent some spares also. But this is an apocryphal story. I don't know if it's correct. They found that out of the spare parts, they could build a complete locomotive. And then it's also said that the British steam locomotive manufacturing units, they were alarmed that now Jamalpur and Ajmer workshop are going to build all the locomotives. So there again, there's a story that the issue was raised in parliament and uh, the British parliament, and then they formed this BISA, British Engineering Standards Association to standardize the locomotive. And um, yes, we were we were there when the hand grenade shop was in existence. From the steel foundry, from the cast iron foundry, grenades were machined in a very hush hush. Uh, we were not allowed to go inside it, but we managed to take a sneak peek. And the grizzled veteran, one Mr. Uh, Roberts, came on, came to us. He was the foreman. He says, what are you doing here? We said, uh, just looking around, you know. He says, sir, 
if you have finished looking around, sir, will you please F off? <laughs> the right amount of uh, deference to our future officership. But at the same time, he was very concerned that uh, we can't allow visitors. And um, that's about it. Uh, Powerhouse had uh, uh, in uh, Powerhouse installed capacity was 10 megawatts, enough to supply the work of the colony. The only one point I want to say, and that is that Jamalpur should become the center of mecha a mechanical engineering museum where all the oldest machines, including those special capstan turrets, and really some of those machines should be preserved because. I don't think anywhere in the world you will get those types of machines. In fact, uh, Wagner of uh, Switzerland, when he saw the original a shaping machine manufactured by them was still being used in ICF, he wanted to <laughs> take that and back to Switzerland. But of course, as usual, we neither uh, preserve nor we give. So, but Jamalpur is an ideal place for a mechanical engineering museum, which should be a, a national heritage museum because we have the oldest machines. I still remember some of them manufactured in 1850s and 1860s. But are these 1850s machines still there? They were there when, they should have, were there, when we were there. I had noticed a plate bending machine dated somewhere in 1850, 60, yeah, exactly. something. 50, 60 years back when we were there, they were there, but are they still there now? They might no, have I, that's why if we don't preserve, they will, if we don't no, try go. and locate, they will go away. Even <laughs> we will not have anything. That's why I'm making this suggestion. Okay. Okay. Any other comment or question? Otherwise, we wind up then. Uh, good morning, sir. P.K. Mishra here, sir. Uh, please, please carry on, Mr. Mishra. Mr. Mishra, please. Sir, beautiful presentation by Jal Singh, sir. It has taken back to the, the old Chad Moab in Jamalpur, sir. I spent in, uh, nine years there, sir. Four years earlier, I just happened this. And five years later on. Uh, two, three things I would like to add about Jamalpur, sir. Jamal Jamalpur was not only center of mechanical department, it was also center for traffic department and also for electrical department, sir. And before Jamalpur came into picture, there was a place called Surul, which became a nucleus for Jamalpur shop. And that Surul was originally belonging to Sina family of Raipur, which gave us Lord Sina. And later on, it was acquired by Rabindranath Thakur family before it was taken over by EIR. So Surul was a nucleus for Jamalpur workshop, sir. And uh, Jamalpur was so important that when Jamalpur was being constructed, both tunnel and workshop, Governor General visited twice in two years, sir. He visited in 60, 61 uh, to see how work can be done. And when he was looking at the tunnel, uh, he wrote a letter to court and he says, the beautiful work is being done, but please tell me what was the need of making this tunnel? And then a uh, equally beautiful reply came from there, sir. Thank you for your concern and appreciation. But uh, the chief engineer told him that for a thousand miles of railway, if there is no tunnel, then what is the engineering challenge in it? <laughs> so instead of diverting a line of for three miles, sir, they created a tunnel which took, took six years in making it. And that was the most difficult challenge. And when uh, US Consul General, Mr. Lilly, came to visit Jamalpur, he said ki, this is a beautiful town and a beautiful workshop is there, but I saw the tunnel and this is the tunnel which became the graveyard of three contractors. And I don't know how much money has been lost in it. And after 164 years, this tunnel has been now doubled last year, sir. But Jamalpur, as, is, as everyone said, sir. You have, have you doubled this tunnel or have you built a second tunnel? Uh, I think uh, you have built... It is uh, just uh, adjoining it, sir. 
yeah, yeah. there are there two separate tunnels not that you got two lines in one tunnel and they have obviously sir otherwise crack will develop sir that yeah yeah yes sir thank thank you sir thank you thank you prashant anyone else right then we coming to the end of the session i'd like to, on behalf of all the members thank jail for an excellent uh, one and a half hours uh, we have had um, he has given us many insights into jamalpur um, uh, i noted the suggestion for making jamalpur into a sort of mechanical engineering uh, museum but the point is how will you get visitors there it is a little out of the way um, um, but i think uh, the need for conservation and preservation is important and uh, i do hope that uh, the present generation of officers are are making an effort to do that so once again thank you i, I would like to thank all the participants and uh, jl in particular for an excellent presentation thank you thank you venu thank you sir thank you very much sir thank you sir goodbye thank you sir thank you sir thank you bye bye Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Himaka Tata here. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful session. I give my comments. Himaka, what did you?